Before I describe the new economic system I think we should build, let's look at the current system through the lens of the three timescales. I'll go through them in the order short term, medium term and long term, because that's their order of importance in current mainstream thinking. So firstly, the short term, from today to a few years time. This is the main one our society thinks about, and in terms of mainstream, current system thinking, this generally involves aiming to maintain the status quo and fend off major crises, and generally trying to keep things together and make it look like the status quo can and should continue. An example of this in relation to climate change is the current insistence that it's still possible to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius as a long-term average, despite the fact that we are now in a third consecutive month of 1.5 degrees and global emissions haven't even peaked yet. Of course, the logic of saying global warming won't get much worse relies on reaching net zero emissions, which brings us to the second timescale, the next 30 years. The establishment goal is to reach net zero by about 2050, which is in nearly 30 years time. So today's political and business leaders do indeed think about this medium term horizon to some extent. But let's look at what their stated goal of going net zero by 2050 really means. First of all, there's no doubt that actually reaching net zero by 2050 is going to involve major transformations across society. Virtually every aspect of modern life relies on fossil fuels, and they provide such a colossal amount of energy that it will be exceptionally difficult, perhaps impossible, to source enough renewable energy to replace all the energy fossil fuels provide, if that's what we try to do. Not only that, but we directly use fossil fuels at all scales across society, from individuals using petrol cars and gas boilers to multinational corporations producing and transporting millions of products. However it's done, reaching net zero is bound to involve some kind of massive transformation. But that's not all. Let's suppose the entire decarbonisation is done through technological innovation that enables the current status quo to continue. In that scenario, would the world of 2050 look like today? No, not even close. If we reach net zero by 2050, that means we'll have 30 years of continuing emissions, 30 years of an increasingly destabilised climate. Think back to what climate change felt like 10 years ago. Sure, it was noticeable if you looked or if your life was closely connected to nature. But think how much worse it is now a continual litany of disasters around the world, unprecedented heat waves killing thousands, vast floods destroying towns, massive wildfires causing pools of smoke for thousands of miles. Net zero in 2050 means that for the next 30 years it will keep getting worse. In 2021, Madagascar was brought to the brink of the world's first climate change famine in the words of the UN. It's only a matter of time before mass death events begin striking the so-called global south. And don't think you're safe if you live in the west and you're fairly wealthy. There are already increasing crop failures and localised shortages of specific foods. At some point, long before net zero in 2050, there's likely to be a major global food shortage. If we only aim for net zero in 2050, the first major food shortage will be exactly that. The first. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for centuries. On top of that, climate change is only one of the environmental problems we face. What about plastic pollution, biodiversity loss and so on? The Stockholm Resilience Centre has calculated we have already crossed six out of nine planetary boundaries and climate change is just one of them. So, the actual plan of the current political and business leaders, who have the most power in the current system, will result in a world in 2050 in which society has gone through a major transformation to reach net zero while maintaining the capitalist system. But the climate has destabilised, probably to such an extent that there is sometimes widespread hunger even in the West. Large areas of the world may have become uninhabitable 
and climate disasters such as heat waves and floods are much more powerful and more frequent than they are today. And because the aim is only net zero, there will be that level of climate disruption according to their plan for hundreds of years. That is a very bad plan. That brings us to the third time scale, the long term. In climate terms, there are major issues on this time scale, including carbon emissions remaining in the atmosphere. The fact that the melting of ice sheets can be set in motion quite quickly and probably irrevocably, but take centuries to occur, and the possibility of tipping points putting the climate into a new, very much degraded, stable state over hundreds of years. But I want to look at the current system on this time scale in a different way putting aside climate change and the environmental crises and looking at it on its own terms, which is to say, in terms of economic performance. I'll break this down by looking at two calculations. The first is about economic growth. A core goal of the current system is economic growth, and this is a goal across scales, including for individual countries as well as for the world as a whole. The usual aim for developed countries is to grow by 3% a year. That doesn't sound like much, but it adds up quickly because it compounds. Next year's 3% is 3% of an economy that's already 3% bigger than it is this year. This means that 3% growth a year equates to a doubling of the economy in less than 25 years. Then that bigger economy doubles over the next 25 years to four times the current size. And this is supposed to keep happening to 8 times the current size, then 16 times, and so on. This means that the goal of 3% growth a year means that the aim is to grow the economy to 256 times its current size over the next 200 years. Now let's look at the second statistic, which relates to poverty. Usually, when we hear about global poverty, it's in relation to extreme poverty, for which the bar is currently set at $2.15 a day. To be clear for Westerners, that really does mean only having $2.15 a day in the West, except that in many extremely poor places, everyone's at about that level, so there isn't much to buy. $2.15 a day is a very low bar. Living off $3 or $5 a day is still poor. In 2018, the economic anthropologist Jason Hickel did some research based on a slightly higher bar of $7.40 a day, which he set as a level that gives people a basic standard of living. Hickel calculated that, at the average rates of economic improvement for the global poor from 1981 to 2015, it would take 200 years to get everyone up to $7.40 a day. 200 years. This means that, those who accept the current economic status quo are effectively aiming for a world in 200 years in which wealthy countries have grown to 250 times their current size, yet some people are living on just over $7.40 a day. That's obscene. So the conclusion of this analysis of our current system is that on the short-term scale, it's just about managing, but in the medium and long term, it is wholly and catastrophically dystopian. We need a new system.